What are you choosing to consume? What are you feeding your mind, your spirit when it comes to pregnancy and birth? Are you listening or watching to things or conversations or people that have a very traumatic focused conversation or mindset when it comes to pregnancy and birth, fear mentality when it comes to pregnancy and birth. Like for example, if the women around you all had C-sections with really traumatic experiences and all of them or some of them hated being pregnant or they, you know, never had a lot of help when they had the newborn. So they just feel like it is the hardest thing you're ever going to do. And they just harp on that because let's be real. A lot of us remember the hard things and the most traumatic things more than anything else. So even if their situation wasn't quote unquote terrible, what they'll try to warn you about the most is the stuff that sucked. (laughs) All people want to tell you is warnings, red flags, things that you don't want to be, uh, uh, get caught up in things that you need to watch out for things that you need to, you know, and it's like, that is not conducive to having a positive mindset about what your pregnancy and birth experience is going to be. I am like winded today. Last night, I started feeling like the baby is definitely growing and expanding. I don't even know how many weeks I am at this point. I think I'm like 25 or 26 weeks-ish. Welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, hi, my name is Jade. If you've been here, welcome back, sis. For the newbies, let me give you a real quick spiel on who I am and what I do and what this platform is all about. So I've been on YouTube for a long time, since 2010, and I was one of those girls that came up during like the natural hair, curly hair phase, okay? Used to go buy lipstick and curls. I have since evolved, okay? And so has my content over time. I still love beauty, and honestly, I post a lot more beauty stuff on my Instagram and like my LTK and things like that. But here on YouTube in this specific season, I am sharing all about my experience as a mom, experience with childbirth, home births, birth center births, hospital birth, like really talking about pregnancy and how we should be looking at such a pivotal moment in our lives, whether we are the ones giving birth or there's somebody around us giving birth. So if you're into it, sis, definitely give me a like, a comment, a subscribe. Also follow me on social media. I kind of sprinkle things here and there, mainly beauty stuff and like lifestyle stuff on Instagram. TikTok is kind of like a free for all. So if you want all the things, TikTok is probably the most kind of like full scope of who I am as a person that you'll get in one place. And then here on YouTube is definitely going to be convos like this where we deep dive and really get vulnerable about real life things. And I hope you get into it because these are the types of videos that for me, I wish I would have watched before I became a mom. And even as a mom, like I feel like not enough of these conversations are happening on the internet. So here we are. If there's one thing that I desire for us, it is to stop normalizing trauma and associating trauma with pregnancy and childbirth. That's what this video is going to be all about. And I'm not going to just talk about why we shouldn't do this and shouldn't do that and shouldn't say this and all the things on the negative side. I'm actually going to talk about how we can shift the narrative. We can start a new conversation, which actually is not even a new conversation. It's just a conversation that not enough of us are having in real life settings. And that's what we're going to do today. Okay. I'm going to break down some ways that you can combat this idea of fear and trauma being associated with pregnancy and birth. So not to be starting on such a Debbie Downer note, but this is the reality of the situation. In my last video, there was a lot of positive comments and I posted clips of my last video talking about why I give birth outside of a hospital as a black woman. 
If you didn't know, I am pregnant for the fourth time. Okay, child, I am a mommy for real. And I have had literally totally different birth experiences with each one of my children. My first child was born in the hospital with an epidural. My second child was born at a birth center, unmedicated, water birth, incredible, beautiful experience. All of them have been beautiful, but like that was the one that really took me to a different level. <laughs> and then my third child was born at home in a birth pool, water birth, unmedicated with just me and my husband because the midwife didn't make it and that's a whole thing in itself. If you want to know more about my birth stories, you could definitely tap the links down below. This fourth baby, I am also planning to have a home birth and I'm working with the same midwife that I had with my last baby, which will be the first time that I've actually kept my prenatal plan and birth plan the exact same because I've looked for something different with each one of my children, except this time I'm trying to repeat this, ex except the whole part where my midwife didn't make it. <laughs> I am wanting to repeat my last birth experience because my home birth was the best out of all three experiences. So that's what this video and the next few videos that I'm doing will be centered around is like this conversation around home birth, birth centers, natural birth, and kind of like really deep diving into it from different aspects, not just, you know, the logistics of like, how do you find a midwife and how do you work through the pain when you're in labor and what's the difference between a midwife and a doula and you know how do i find a birth center like those are questions that i'll definitely answer throughout these videos and kind of will also do probably a deep dive here and there but i really want to have conversations that kind of surround those logistical things right because you have to really be in a mental and emotional spiritual place to even get to a point where you're considering this alternate way of having babies because our in this day and age traditional way normal way to have babies is you go to a hospital go see your OBGYN through your prenatal experience go to the hospital stay there a couple days have the baby you know we know right and so I want to have conversations that if you are someone who is on the fence about it if you are even somebody who's like I could never or someone that's like, I desire this, like this is what I want for my experience to be whenever I do become a mom, that, that's where we wanna live, okay? That's where these conversations will live because I think there needs to be more discourse about this topic because it's literally a part of all of our lives, okay? Like we all come from a womb, okay? So we should be having more conversations about this. And so this is why Today's video is the second video in this like series that I'm doing is because the first thing that comes up for so many of us when we think about natural birth, doing birth outside of a hospital setting is fear and trauma. And this idea that so many people had such terrible home birth or natural birth experiences and that's why the hospitals became the number one place to have babies and so many babies you know would pass away or moms would pass away outside of the hospital so the hospitals became you know this safe haven for moms and that is not necessarily the accurate way that this all came to be okay now this is not a history lesson video i'm not going to go into all of it but when i tell you child i have read books i have watched documentaries i have listened to elders talk about how we got to this place in america specifically when it comes to childbirth is not really what a lot of us think before we actually experience giving birth in a hospital and all that kind of stuff so not to get too deep into that, but if you are interested in learning more of the history of how we got to this place in our healthcare system, specifically talking about pregnancy and birth, comment down below. Let me know if enough of y'all are interested. I can definitely do kind of like a deep dive from a historical perspective because that definitely was part of my own journey as to going not even just from a hospital to a birth center but even going to home birth and feeling this pull to 
learn more of why midwives are not more common, especially for black women when community is so integrated into like our cultural backgrounds, you know what I mean? People of color. And so there's a lot there. Okay. There's a lot there. So that's another video for another day. Let me know if you want that video. I could definitely put some things together and show y'all some resources and just moments and things that like stuck out to me that I was just like, whoa, I had no idea and pushed me even further into where I am now. First things first, let's not get it twisted. We have experienced so much trauma associated with pregnancy and birth, especially as black women that is no way in shape or form being devalued in this conversation, okay? That's why I'm addressing that first. The heartbreak, the disparity, the generational breakdowns that happen when a mother or a child is lost because of error in childbirth or pregnancy at any point. It is a tragedy and it is the driving force as to why the conversation we're going to have today in this video is so important because as a pregnant woman myself when i was a first time mom before i had my baby i was insanely afraid of passing away during childbirth that is a legitimate fear for me because not only did i see the statistics at when I got pregnant, not before I got pregnant, but when I was pregnant, I saw the t statistics. And then even in my own family, generationally, not just one generation, but the two above me, so not my mom, but the two above my mom, I have grandmothers who have passed away in pregnancy or birth related circumstances that were incredibly tragic. And this is not the time that I'm going to share those details because we're not ready for that, okay? That's this, you know. But if you know, you know. When it comes to black families especially, things that some of our grandmothers and aunties and gra those generations had so many things going against them. And especially in childbirth and labor and pregnancy it didn't let up like we didn't get a break as black people when it came to pregnancy or bringing new life into the world so recognizing that is so important because that is where we're coming from from a perspective of historical but the other part of it is that there are stories and experiences where trauma was not attached to pregnancy and birth even in our own communities and hopefully i will have the space and the time to really share some of those stories i gotta find some child because i've read them across my journey of research and things on my own but i have to go back into some of the books and things that i have um to find some but to share specifically because it's one thing to talk about positive births in the past but it's another to really tell someone's story about it and so that's why i lean on my own experiences because that's you know i'm firsthand like this is my life and i'm telling you my life and so i in no way shape or form in this conversation want to minimize the trauma that is associated with pregnancy and birth people's real lived experiences that i would never question and honestly have such a deep compassion and empathy for because no woman no child no family no husband no partner no no one should have to walk through pregnancy loss pregnancy mortality birth mortality infant loss like that is like the most just heartbreaking thing and like i said i'm having this conversation to combat all of that to give us something else to put our minds and our hearts and focus on because even as a pregnant woman i have to have hope <laughs> like i choose to walk in a way where i am confident about my ability physically and mentally to birth my child without complications and even if complications arise i have 
the strength and the confidence in God to know that whatever happens, I will be okay. My children will be okay. My family will be okay. Even if it doesn't necessarily look the way that I would want it to look. Because obviously when you're pregnant and you have new children and all of these things, you're starting a family, like you don't want to anticipate something going wrong, but it's naive to think that nothing could go wrong. You know what I mean? But at the same time, it's a matter of managing your expectations and walking in faith and walking in hope and light and not in death and despair and anxiety because you could have two totally different experiences being pregnant and they totally can affect the outcome of your pregnancy and your birth. These are the factors that contribute to this trauma fear mentality that so many of us walk into birth with. Factor number one is our physical state. That's such a large conversation in itself. That's starting from before you even get pregnant. How are you eating? What are your lifestyle choices on a regular basis? How are you preparing your body to carry life? And if you are in childbearing years, there's no reason why we shouldn't be having that conversation. And not even just on a physical level, but on a mental level as well. Your mind and mental state is so important to be aware of before, during, and after you have a child. Making sure that your lifestyle and the people around you that are supporting you through your trying to conceive era, to your pregnancy era, to your postpartum and mom era, that the people around you are supporting you and the choices that you're making through that journey because y'all have to understand that matters so much more than you think before you have kids. Like you think, yeah, I'm have support and blah, 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 like my friends and my family before you get pregnant, but nah, 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 nah. It's when you get pregnant, when you have that newborn, when you're going through postpartum, that you will really see who is for you and who is really not but they even think they are in this like weird toxic way because they think that their version of helping you is the best way to help even if it conflicts with the choices that you've made you know what i mean example you want to breastfeed but your mom or your mother-in-law is just beating it down your throat that you don't need to and that you need to give that baby a bottle and you need to do this and this and this with that baby and that type of energy. Like you have to be mindful that when you become a mom and mamas, y'all know what I'm talking about. It's like this switch flips and you realize that this ain't nobody else's baby but mine and my partner, obviously. But like that's your baby. And you start to realize that some people will try to overtake or control your experience as a mom. And sometimes they don't even realize it because they're coming from a quote unquote good place. But at the same time, outside of the bounds of what you agree with, it can be detrimental and really affect your mental health, like in a real way. So being mindful of your physical state and your mental state is a huge factor in whether or not you're going to be able to combat the fear and this like mentality of, of trauma that you may or may not be carrying into your pregnancy and birth experience. The other part of this is your mental state and capability of even envisioning a positive experience this is like what are you choosing to consume what are you feeding your mind your spirit when it comes to pregnancy and birth are you listening or watching to things or conversations or people that have a very traumatic focused it like conversation or mindset when it comes to pregnancy and birth fear mentality when it comes to pregnancy and birth like for example if the women around you all had c-sections with really traumatic experiences and all of them or some of them hated being pregnant or they you know never had a lot of help when they had the newborn so they just feel like it is the hardest thing you're ever going to do and they just harp on that because let's be real a lot of us remember the hard things and the most traumatic things 
more than anything else. So even if their situation wasn't quote unquote terrible, what they'll try to warn you about the most is the stuff that sucked, (laughs) the stuff that was really terrible. And if you don't watch it, you'll start to feel like all people want to tell you is warnings, red flags, things that you don't want to be, uh, uh, get caught up in things that you need to watch out for things that you need to, you know, and it's like, that is not conducive to having a positive mindset about what your pregnancy and birth experience is going to be. You have to find ways to counteract those conversations and that content with content and conversations that are more about hope in a future for you, your pregnancy, your child, your postpartum. I I did not hear a, anyone really talk about how positive postpartum could be. Everybody talks about postpartum depression and postpartum anxiety, which are very real things and I've experienced them, okay? I've experienced them in a real way and what I feel now that I'm going into my, I'm into my fourth pregnancy, I'm going to go into a fourth postpartum journey in the future. There have been specific things that I changed. And the biggest one being the way I saw and the way I anticipated postpartum. Because when I didn't think about it, I didn't know anything about it. I didn't talk to nobody about it. It really didn't affect me. My first child, I didn't have I didn't have any issues postpartum. It was with my second that I had the worst postpartum experience mentally and physically because I was anticipating it to be terrible. And not only that, I had some physical needs that I was not meeting for myself because I'm running after a toddler. I'm still trying to work. I'm still trying to be me. And I'm going from one child to two, which is difficult. So I wasn't eating enough. I wasn't showering enough. I wasn't like mentally in a good place. And I didn't prepare myself at all to for myself for postpartum. I was getting all the stuff for the baby, like trying to prep for work stuff. Like I'm doing everything else, but for me and like making sure that I had things in, in place in case I needed some extra grace during postpartum, I didn't prepare anything. And I, and I wasn't mindful of, of what I was listening or watching. So it wasn't, I, I just wasn't mindful enough about what, was to come. And so I was unprepared and it really took a toll on me. And so with my third, because of that experience, I made sure that I communicated with my husband what I needed for my postpartum before I got to that point. I made sure that I chose to only consume things that uplifted me and inspired me and felt like gave me strength. And I also made sure that I had food (laughs) that I really communicated to my husband that like, listen, make sure that I'm eating, make sure that I'm drinking, make sure because I didn't I don't have like my in-laws and my sisters and stuff like they help brothers, they help here and there. But like we didn't have a night nanny or night nurse or like a, a doula or anything like that. Like we just like doing it on our own pretty much help here and there. But my husband is the main person that's consistently there, right? So like I had to communicate to him, like what did I need? And also internally, like my faith and my spirituality is such a huge part of how I got through postpartum the last time in such a better mental state because I knew where my strength was going to come from. It was not always going to come from me physically. Sometimes, most of the time, all the time, it needed to come from God. So if I was having a rough day or I was just feeling hormonally all over the place, which is what is happening postpartum, your hormones are literally dropping and and just going all over the place because your bodies are readjusting to not having the baby in it anymore. Um, I made sure that I had tinctures. Like I had uh, this tincture that I would take called Baby Blues. It, I think the brand is called Mother Ease or something. I'll, If you want the link, I'll put it down below. But there was like supplements that I took that literally helped me stay in a positive headspace because I knew I'm not gonna be able to control my hormones all the time during postpartum. Like, so 
there may be nothing wrong, but because my hormones are all over the place, I feel incredibly depressed or I feel incredibly anxious or I feel that postpartum rage. And there would be no explanation other than my hormones are just adjusting. So because I knew that and I had the wisdom of that, I kept things like baby blues tinctures and I would make my little electrolyte postpartum drink. And that helped me so much this last postpartum that it was leaps and bounds better than the second one when I wasn't prepared. And that leads us into factor number three, which is the type of education and support that we have around us to combat the fear of trauma and anticipating trauma in our pregnancy and birth experiences. I just talked all about that, like making sure that you communicate, like what is it that you need? And if you don't know what you need, then try to research some options before you get to the point so that even if you're like, I think I'm gonna be good, I think I'm gonna be okay, you know, postpartum, whatever, like just have something in your notes that's like, in case I feel like this, in case I feel anxious, in case I feel depressed, Here's some things that I've seen other people talk about or I've seen other people use that have helped them, whether that be, you know, tinctures, like I just said, reading your Bible, um, listening to certain types of music, doing some just like prayer or I'm not a meditation person, child, but like if that helps you calm down, breathing techniques, things like that, that just help you calm your nervous system down, just having those in case is smart to do because at the end of the day if you just walk around with like fear dormant and it's like this fear is tricky right because you may not always feel afraid right you may be having a good day you may be good you know whatever but fear just sneaks up and sometimes it's like the underlying tone of how you make decisions if you are triggered by something that fear will just spike and it will completely cloud your judgment and your ability to like make decisions with a clear mind because everything is just like you can't see past the fear right so if you're in a situation where you're in labor and you have a birth plan in place but you know, something happens at the hospital or something happens with you and you start to get afraid and you're like, wait, this is, you know, this is getting intense and I don't know if I want to see section. I don't know if I want to be induced. I don't know. And then a doctor comes in and says, well, we think you should do X, Y, and Z. And you are so afraid in the moment that you're just like, okay, well, I trust you, doctor. Let's do it. Versus having a way to combat that fear and say, well, hold on a second. Let me breathe for a second. Let me catch my breath and let me sit with this question that you're asking me about something that's going to deter me from having the birth plan that I wanted. Let me give me a second and knowing your rights, knowing how to advocate for yourself in those hospital settings, especially is so important and not just you know how to do it, but make sure whoever's with you also knows how to do it and Preferably, if you're in a hospital setting, have a doula there because the doula is really going to be super imperative for you because no matter what happens, that doula is going to be there who's not going to be in labor, who's not going to be the partner of the person in labor or the mother-in-law of the person in labor or the sister of the person in labor, but they are a sober voice fully aware of everything that's going on like that is their moment they are they train for that okay so in case anything goes on they are well aware of like what's supposed to be happening and what's not supposed to be happening but this is also why i talk so much about positive pregnancies and births because there are ways for us to have positive births and pregnancy experiences, even if we're in a hospital, even if we don't get the exact birth plan that we put together, there are ways for us to still have beautiful birth experiences. We just have to be educated and aware of what those can look like and prepared in case plan A don't go as planned. We got a plan B and a plan C and we are comfortable and confident in those choices that we've made for ourselves and our babies. So here are a few real ways that you can prepare yourself for a positive pregnancy and positive birth experience. First, Acknowledge that the fear exists. It's okay to be afraid of what's 
coming and what to expect, especially as a first time mom, first time parent, you're going to be scared because you have no idea what to anticipate and how to like think, you know, but don't allow that to be the driving force behind the decisions that you make when it comes to your pregnancy and birth experiences. Second, if you've had a traumatic experience with birth or pregnancy, or you are being made aware, maybe somebody else's story hit your heart and you're just like, wow, like what else could have been done? Explore that. What else could have happened in your situation in the past or in someone else's situation that you're trying to learn from? What else could have happened that would have made the outcome better? And that is part of the healing process for either yourself or even the person that may have had that experience or whatever it may be. Like if it was you specifically, healing from that experience is important because say you have a traumatic experience with your first baby and you're pregnant with your second, you don't wanna carry the trauma from your first birth to your second because then it's like you're tainting something that could be on its own so beautiful, so innocent, so untainted by fear, but you're making the decision to carry the fear because you haven't dealt with it, you haven't healed from it. And sometimes, simply, we're not ready to heal. Sometimes the pain and the hurt is so large and big and monstrous that we're not there yet mentally and physically like when we get pregnant that next time and that's okay but it's just a matter of like being aware of where you really are and saying even though I am scared even though I experienced such a traumatic you know situation with my last baby I don't want that to be the reality for this next one so how do I look at the past and say, this could have been better. How can I adjust what I'm anticipating versus like, maybe you had a hospital birth and you didn't have support there. Your partner didn't know what to do when the doctors started rushing in and trying to like give you Pitocin and trying to induce you. And then you had to get a forced C-section and all that kind of stuff. Like y'all didn't know what to do, right? So instead of just carrying that fear with you and trauma with you into this next pregnancy instead say you know what how can i educate myself how can we learn more about how to be prepared for those monumental moments when decisions may need to be made very quickly you know and so that goes into potentially hiring a doula it is an expense yes but it is one that may <laughs> save your life or your child's life to be quite honest and the third thing is that we can't just have these conversations between girl to girl woman to woman mama to mama we need to bring in men we need to have these conversations with the men in our lives not just our husbands or our partners but our brothers our sons we have to really make sure that bringing up boys and men who have an awareness of what to kind of anticipate when it comes to pregnancy and birth, that's a crucial part. They are a crucial part because they are the ones that pour into mommy. And if mommy is poured into emotionally, physically, then she is able to pour into the baby or babies emotionally and physically because so much is taken from us when we're growing a baby, when the baby's out and we're breastfeeding or we're bottle feeding or whatever we choose to do, so much of us is like, pouring out right that is motherhood but our men need to be ready for that they need to be ready for the role that they need to play in those moments and it's not just about pushing all this information on them when you're about to go into labor or when you're in the room trying to explain to your husband or to whoever like what to do and you're in labor and they're like wait what I'm not even like mentally like I can't even believe you know don't wait till the last minute or until it's too late to try to educate. Instead, try to find ways to make these conversations a part of your everyday life. If you see somebody that's pregnant or if you, you know, see somebody on TV that's having a baby, like have conversations about it. Ask them 
What do you think about it? How would you feel in that situation? Are you okay being around blood? Are you, or would you freak out if you watched me have a baby? Would you hold my leg? Would you catch the baby? Have these conversations with men because they have a pivotal role in our experiences as well. And like for me, we didn't know that for our third child, it would just be me and my husband. And if I had not had the type of husband who had a very integral role in my other birth experiences and being a supportive husband and all that kind of stuff, he may not have been in the position to literally catch my baby when no one else was there. So bringing men into this conversation is so, so important. And I think for one of these videos, I'm going to bring in my husband because I think that him speaking from a man's perspective because he had a child at 19 out outside of wedlock and had a whole traumatic experience with his first daughter that he felt like he was so detached from to now having us, you know, on our fourth baby being like literally helping me give birth. Like the drastic experience differences um, are ones that I think like he can shed a lot of light on. So I have to tap him to come in one of these videos sometime soon. But the last thing and so important is to teach our children about birth and pregnancy in a very age appropriate way. Okay. Cause I know I had posted a clip of me talking about my four year old daughter being in the room when I gave birth, that's being a prayer of mine for this baby. And people were like, she's too young. That's inappropriate for a child. Like let a child be a child kind of thing. And this may just be a difference in parenting and like opinion, but my child, if she's a, if she's there, I want her to be aware. Like I want her to experience because literally childbirth and pregnancy is the most natural thing she will ever experience herself or around other people. It's life and death, like life and death, like life death is a, is a is a no escaping it we are all going to pass on from this life at some point in time right and we are all born into this life at some point in time right so i want to teach her about life i want to use that as an opportunity to help her understand from a young age the vastness and the the depth of what that looks like as women as families and all those things obviously if anything were to go wrong while i'm in labor my midwife our team my husband would remove her and my other children from the the situation right like we're not going to just like allow her to experience a traumatic event knowingly right if something were to go wrong but I feel confident that having her there is more of a benefit than anything else. And we live in a world where so many of our children are exposed to things before we want them to be. And we are not the ones exposing them to things, right? So like they end up learning about birth and pregnancy and, and SEX and everything like that on the internet or on social media or on TV or whatever. And then we have no control over that first initial exposure to said thing, right? And so what I see this as is an opportunity for me to expose my children as I'm, you know, as I'm walking around with a baby in my belly and they know that there's a baby in my belly, like we talk about it be, even at four, I have a two and a half year old, I have a one 18, 20 month year old, like, we have these conversations in very age appropriate ways because it's part of life. Like, it, why are we acting like four year olds shouldn't know about how human beings come to be? Like, that's the part that I just, but to each his own. If you don't want your child in the room, like, that's, that's your prerogative, and I can understand it. And I, fully support people making their own decisions for their own kids, okay? That's why I feel so confident in making decisions for my own kids because I'm the parent, all right? And nobody's gonna like overrule me on that. But I think genuinely that if we had more conversations, age appropriate, right, with our children, bringing in our husbands, men, 
like we would affect the future generation of mothers and fathers in a way that we could never really understand being raised the way we were. I don't remember my mom ever talking about pregnancy or birth when I was a child, like at all. And she had four kids and I was the oldest of all of them. <laughs> like I, we didn't have conversations. I would see her pregnant. I would know when my brothers or sisters were born and I would be there when the new baby comes and all that. But like there was never conversations about like what that experience was like for her at all. And I don't know about my friends or the people that I grew up with, but like, I don't think they had those conversations either because by the time I became a mom, I didn't know nothing. I knew some stuff, but not really anything. And I just don't want that for my daughter if I can help it. So I try to be very communicative of these life things that are part of life. Like, you know what I mean? So yeah, so these are some of the ways that I think that just on a very basic level, we can shift the narrative, if not in a large way, just simply in our homes, in our communities, in our close communities, how we can shift the conversations around pregnancy and birth, knowing that we are actually combating such intense fear and trauma from people's real lived experiences, right? Like we're not diminishing that, but we want to be able to speak hope and life into situations for the future. And we want to walk towards things with a positive outlook and not allowing simply fear and trauma to taint or project and change what could be our future. So that's all I got for y'all today. This was a lengthier video. I hope you enjoyed it and you stuck with me through the whole thing, child. But let me know down below if there's anything that hit your heart, that sparked your interest in this video that you want me to go deeper into, into this conversation. But until then, y'all take care. Mamas, if you're pregnant right now, praying for you, praying for your womb praying for your baby praying for your mental health your spiritual health your physical health and yeah i'm praying the same things for me too because <laughs> we getting there we almost had the third trimester and next thing we know we're gonna have a whole newborn in these little videos okay so yeah i love y'all thank y'all for tuning in and i will see you in my next video bye